Hi, everybody. I'm Nicole. I'm a heroin addict. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I don't get to go to a lot of HA meetings anymore, and um, I just appreciate the chance to come here and and sharing my story. It keeps me sober another day. It gets me out of my head. Um, I was able to come here last week, too, and I, I always just leave a meeting feeling recharged and refreshed and good to be around, you know, fellow heroin addicts who are recovered and, and trying to live this way of life. So um, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know why. I've been sober for eight years, and my mind always tells me that I'm, like, not uh, good enough, you know, and I think that's, like, part of this disease, right? Like, I'm not enough of a heroin addict. I'm not enough of an alcoholic. I'm not enough of whatever, uh, you know, because of how my story is, you know, and my story is that I got sober when I was 19 years old. And my drinking and drug use was three years. Um, but things got really, really, really bad really quick. And I'm grateful for that because I think if things had played out differently, I might not be here today. Um, so I'll start off with what it was like and then what, it, what happened, what it's like now. Um, what it was like growing up, uh, I don't have any brothers or sisters and I wasn't around uh, any alcohol or drugs. I had a pretty good childhood, uh, some not so great things. Um, I know today that like circumstances don't make me uh, a heroin addict. Um, you know, I've met people who grow up all different kinds of ways, all different kinds of parents or home situations or whatever else, um, and we still end up here, you know what I mean? So I don't try to figure out today uh, what made that happen. I think I was just born um, with this disease. Uh, but I didn't grow up around any alcohol or drugs. I was a pretty good kid. I liked school. I had hobbies. Um, and I remember uh, when I was like maybe 11, 12, 13 years old, my mom, who I was super close with, always told me like, you don't need drugs or alcohol to be happy. And I know that sounds like so corny, whatever. Um, but like 12 year old me was like, yeah, okay. Like I believe that. Um, and I went to concerts all the time. She let me dye my hair pink and purple and like do whatever I wanted. Otherwise, I got good grades in school and and um, I really believed that. I didn't have any reason not to. Um, she also told me like there's a lot of uh, alcoholism in our family. Like it's really not a good idea if you ever like drink or, or do drugs. And um, and I was afraid of that. Um, Knowing what I know now, what's inside of our big book, I think that I had a lot of the signs of this disease before I ever even picked up a drink or a drug. Uh, being driven by a hundred forms of fear, being selfish and self-centered, being dishonest, being manipulative, um, being delusional, um, like it talks about in the third step, like trying to orchestrate the play, being an actor trying to run the whole show. Um, this idea that I can wrest happiness and satisfaction out of life if only I manage well, all that kind of stuff was there when I was like 14, 15 years old, you know, before I ever even picked up, um, you know, that feeling of being restless, irritable, discontented. I had some other problems going on. And like I said, I had a mostly good childhood, some not so great stuff. My parents were divorced. There was like abuse in my family, um, some mental health stuff, whatever. But for the most part, I had a really good childhood, really good life. Uh, and fast forward a little bit. I I don't even remember. I know tons of people say, like, they remember the very first time they drank, the very first time they ever tried a drug. Uh, and for me, like, I know that when I was maybe, like, 14 or 15 years old, I drank a few times and tried smoking pot once. And I remember when I tried smoking pot, I was so such a nerd. I was so terrified of getting grounded that I like scrubbed my hands with laundry detergent and ate like half a tube of toothpaste because I thought like my mom's going to know and I'm going to be grounded. Um, that's just the kind of kid that I was. And when friends of mine started uh, to like drink and do drugs and stuff like that, I remember I was the one who was like afraid. I didn't want to skip school. I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, the only thing I really did was smoke cigarettes. And uh, even that I was like secretive about and scared about. Um, so when I was 15, I was in the room when my mom, uh, who was otherwise super healthy, suddenly had like a really massive brain aneurysm. 
uh, and it was really, really scary and horrible. Um, she was sick for five or six months, uh, and then she passed away, and she was only 50 years old, and then I, I was 16 at that time. Um, and for the following several years, I thought, like, if this happened to you, then you would drink and do drugs like I, I do too, kind of thing. Um, I know today that that's not the case at all. You know, I wish that things didn't happen the way they did, but I know that um, that's not what makes me have the reaction that I do when I put alcohol and drugs into my body. I'm just wired differently. Um, but circumstances made it so that, you know, this like straight A student who was, I was super close with my mom and my stepdad and, uh, good kid and did my homework and played the piano and took dance classes and stuff. Um, I went from that to like, I want to give drinking and drugs like another try. Um, and I very quickly, you know, the progression was quick. I hear people talk about, for some people, they were like, casual martini drinkers at happy hour and then within 20 years they were like alcoholics and drug addicts and different things and it just wasn't my experience it was very 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 quick um so all of a sudden i you know went from having hobbies and having like friends who were good influences and being honest and a good kid and whatever else, I went from that to living with my uh, real dad, who I didn't live with since I was two, and I could do suddenly whatever I wanted. Um, a little like side story, my dad was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous in his 20s and hasn't drank in 30 years, but has not uh, stayed sober and is very, very spiritually sick and has a lot of problems with drugs. Um, so it was the ideal arrangement, you know. Uh, I went, I, I quit any uh, hobbies that I was into, I quit. Um, I isolated a lot from my friends. My friends group got really small. And I was willing to, like, try uh, um, any drugs, any alcohol, any drugs. Uh, alcohol is like a huge part of my story too. I de identify as an alcoholic and for a long, long, long time I didn't think that I was an alcoholic. Um, and with drugs I would literally try anything, you know what I mean? Um, anything that I could get my hands on. Uh, and uh, of all the things that I was trying during that time, um, opiates really caught my attention. Um, so my dad would like buy me alcohol. Uh, we smoked a lot of pot together. He grew pot in our house. I would lie about, I started skipping school. Uh, I would lie about that, but he worked construction, so he'd leave super early and go to bed super early so I could get away with skipping school. Um, there was no more like hanging my report card on the fridge or my mom used to like call so-and-so's mom to make sure that's where I was sleeping over. My dad didn't give a shit, so I could do whatever I wanted. Um, you know, and I, uh, I tried like hallucinogens, I tried, uh, cocaine, I tried smoking crack once, uh, and of all the things that I was trying, and I was trying anything and everything that I could, you know, it just so happened to be like the people that I was hanging out with got sketchier and sketchier and sketchier, and I would do whatever I could find, and, um, I had an older... I think the very first time I ever tried opiates, I had an older cousin who is now 10 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, at the time give me like a handful of Laura tabs, and I had no idea what they were. I was at my grandma's house. I took them, and I remember I just felt like kind of pukey and super itchy, um, <laughs> I, you know, and then was like, I guess this is pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to try this again, you know, and... This was like before Oxycontin was huge, so a lot of what I did was a lot of Laura tabs and Percocet, and I thought it was like the best thing in the world, uh, along with like drinking whenever I could, smoking pot every single day, and I would try, you know, random other stuff. Um, and things got like progressively worse. I managed to somehow get through high school. I think that I made a lot of teachers feel bad for me because my mom died, and I would, you know, pay play the uh, pity card 
and just show up enough to like hand stuff in and, and skate by. I almost failed gym. My gym teacher let me do like a project on nutrition, so I didn't fail gym. Um, you know, but like I said, my world was getting smaller and smaller. My group of friends got smaller and smaller. I no longer took dance. I didn't play the piano. I didn't go to concerts. Any money that I had went towards drugs. Um, and it was getting worse and worse. Uh, I remember uh, my dad, you know, who I had found, like, cocaine in his stuff before. And like I said, we would smoke pot together all the time finding pills and like getting mad at me and trying to like reprimand me and I thought like this is you know bullshit you can't tell me to not do this and he was like getting afraid of if I was like taking a lot of pills and driving and stuff like that um and I just thought like how bizarre you know the last thing I wanted to do was stop in any way shape or form so I just got more and more dishonest about it um and I remember the uh, first time I tried heroin, I was, a lot of my, like, alcoholism and not being able to drink safely is that I would start off the night drinking and then want to go and do drugs, you know, and I can't, and I've tried to, like, just drink and smoke pot, and I've tried to, like, just do drugs, and for me, the two go hand in hand. Um, so I was drinking at a party, and I remember saying, like, I want to get pills, let's call so-and-so, and I called this person. Uh, and I was probably 17, maybe 18, and um, they said, I don't have whatever pills, but I have H. And I was like, I've seen Requiem for a Dream. Like, is H heroin? And uh, I got, I'm from Buffalo, and I thought, like, does Buffalo even have heroin? Like, where do you get this? Um, so I was kind of drunk. I told the friends that I was with, and they said, absolutely not. We're not going to buy heroin. Um, and then, like, I think of how this disease is cunning, baffling, and, and powerful. I, like, lied and manipulated and said, like, no, I'm totally just kidding. Would never do that. He has these pills. Let's go. Uh, and then I didn't have any money, so I, like, borrowed money from the friends that I was with and was like, yeah, let's try heroin. That sounds like a really good idea. Um, as simple as that, you know what I mean? And... Uh, without like looking at it or knowing what was going on, the person who I was getting it from got it all ready in a needle. And I thought like, whoa, uh, okay, like I guess this is happening. Um, and I remember feeling like really, really, really excited about it. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget that. And because I was already doing so many pills and things like that, I think I, I, think I got ripped off like $20 for one bag or something like that. But, uh, this person shot me up and I remember thinking like, this is really, really amazing. Like, this is what I want to do. Um, and it didn't feel, like I said, I had like a high tolerance from pills and stuff. So it didn't feel like that crazy even of a high, but it planted a seed. And I remember the next day when I was not drunk thinking to myself, like, I want to try that again. Um, and I did. And the next day I want to try that again. And I remember... Uh, on the third day uh, in a row going to this like really shitty house on the west side of Buffalo with a, with needles everywhere and questionably homeless people everywhere and like somebody saying like oh how long have you been doing heroin and I was like oh I don't do heroin this is like the third day and they just laughed and I remember feeling like this broken scary feeling and uh I was like an IV heroin user every single day from the very first day I tried it. That sounds like, you know, uh, dare program speech, but like that's the truth. Um, <laughs> you know, that's how it happened. And I remember um, things got really, really, really bad really fast. I graduated high school um, and I felt very quickly like I had nothing to live for. Um, except for to get high. I remember another time watching like VH1 drug wars or some shit like that, some documentary with my dad and saying like, did you ever try heroin or whatever, you know, asking him about it because I was kind of like afraid that I was like hooked. And I remember him saying like any of my friends that I knew uh, with needles in their arms, their days were numbered. 
and I just kind of like swallowed hard. And uh, I was scared, but I, I truly thought like, I'm just going to do heroin for a summer and then like get my shit together, maybe do some counseling and go to college and it's going to be just fine. Um, that's not how things wound up. Uh, so things got really, really uh, bad. You know, I spent my mom's IRA retirement money in a matter of three or four months and didn't even remember doing it. I lost a lot of her jewelry um, and I would steal from people. I stole from my grandma all the time. I, uh, you know, did really degrading things for money. Um, and it was just awful, really awful. Uh, I remember like still trying to go to house parties and act normal and hide it from like the boyfriend I had at the time and the friends that I had at the time. Um, but I was like a mess, you know what I mean? I had like track marks all over my arms. Uh, I was like never coherent. I, uh, more than once would like come to pick up my boyfriend from his house and fall out like in my car uh, on like a hot summer day with all the windows up and like come to a few hours later. Um, you know, I had two part-time jobs and I got fired from one and I quit the other. Um, I was getting high while driving and crashed my car really bad. Um, funny story, I crashed my car really bad and like the next day got my wisdom teeth out and my dad came with me and said, my daughter is an opiate addict, don't give her any prescription. And I thought like, I'm just gonna fucking shoot heroin to get through the pain of getting my wisdom teeth out. And I remember like riding my bike, this must have been before I lost both jobs, because I was riding my bike with like bloody cotton packed in my mouth, like high in heroin to my shitty grocery store job. Um, you know, and things were getting like, just darker and darker and darker. And uh, I remember the exact day when uh, my boyfriend at the time told my dad, like, your daughter is a heroin addict, like, um, and it scared me and it made me really angry and I tried to lie about it. Um, and that was like the beginning of the end. Um, from the period of 2009 to 2010, I was in five rehabs, uh, one for young people, a couple in Pennsylvania, um, detox a couple of times. My dad had me mental health arrested once. And I spent some time in the psych ward at ECMC Hospital in Buffalo. And um, intermittently, whenever I could, in between all these like hospitalizations and treatment programs, I would uh, shoot heroin and um, things just got shittier and shittier and shittier. One of the darkest times was I had like hitchhiked back from a rehab in Pennsylvania uh, and decided to live with a schizophrenic heroin addict that I met in the psych ward. Um, I thought, I didn't think he was schizophrenic because I thought like I'm in the psych ward and I'm not crazy so not everybody here is crazy. Um, quickly found out that he totally was schizophrenic. And uh, we were living on an air mattress on his mom's like living room floor um, using dirty fucking needles and <coughs> robbing people and scrounging together like quarters to try to get high. Like who can we rob? What can we do? Um, begging the drug dealer for an extra bag, like just awful shitty, um, sick way to live, you know, um, smoking cigarette butts off the ground. Uh, I would eat like once every several days. Um, it was just really horrible and, uh, I wanted to die and, uh, I didn't know how to stop. I didn't think that I could stop. I'll never forget one of the last times that I got high, I just shot up like a whole bunch of dope and it did nothing. Like I felt physically a reaction, 
but all that loudness in my head, that spiritual sickness, um, was totally still there, loud and clear. Like, I know what they mean when they say, like, it stopped working for me. Like, that's what happened. No matter how much I did, um, it stopped working for me. And uh, intermittently, I was introduced to AA and NA. Um, and I leaned more towards AA. And I was just remembering on my way here, um, some nice woman, like, brought me to an AA meeting and I robbed money out of her purse and then left the meeting to go get high. Um, like, that's the kind of person that I was. Like, how fucking terrible is that? She's on my amends list, and I've never been able to make amends to her because she moved away from Buffalo, and I have no idea where she is. But uh, that's the kind of person I was, you know, and um, just not done, not ready to get sober. Um, and what started to change was that, like, I'm really, really grateful that I had family that intervened and that, uh, you know, I ran out of money. I ran out of options. I couldn't, like, just get high however I wanted to because while no human power can get or keep me sober, it can slow me down from, like, getting high the way I want to get high, you know, and make me think about things a little bit. And that's what it did. Um, and seeds were planted all along. Um, you know, at first I thought, like, I'm too young, I'm 19, um, maybe I can't be doing heroin, like there aren't social, you know, social heroin addicts who just like <laughs> shoot a little dope on the weekends, like that's not a thing. Um, but I can definitely still drink, I can definitely still smoke pot. Um, and I tried that theory and two weeks later I had a needle in my arm again, you know. Um, and then I thought, like, okay, well, I can't do any of it, but I'm not going to be sober forever because that sounds terrible. Um, I'll give it, you know, a few months, and I would fall flat on my face again. Um, and the very last time that I got high, I was in treatment, like a long-term place, and I uh, was going to a lot of AA meetings. I asked a woman to be my sponsor, uh, and I went through the first three steps with her, but I wasn't praying. I wasn't calling women. I wasn't uh, talking to anybody at the group that I considered my home group, let alone doing service. I wasn't honest with the sponsor. I thought she was, like, older and probably a little bit dumb and, like, didn't understand me. Um, and after six months... Um, and I would hear all the readings, like, all the time. Half measures avail us nothing. Like, we stood at the turning point with complete abandon. Um, you know, and I still just had, like, one foot in the door, one foot out the door. And uh, I ended up going on, like, a pass to Buffalo for the day and shooting a bunch of heroin. And uh, that's, like, the very last time that I used and I remember feeling like super close to overdosing and really afraid and uh, didn't I didn't I managed to botch a drug test and didn't get caught and I felt really the first time like something was different was like I felt really terrible about it and um, ended up like telling the people there the next day and I remember my mom's two sisters my aunts um, who are like moms to me uh, coming to visit and saying like what is wrong with you this is the fifth rehab we're really 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 sick of this like you gotta get it together like didn't you want to be sober and I know that sounds like so simple it wasn't any of the crazy like consequence outside manageability like stuff I had been through before it was as simple as like oh my god like I can't stop even if I want to um I had heard all those things you know in the big book of like We've lost the power of choice, like, in and of ourselves, we'll always, you know, drink again or use again. Um, we have a strange mental twist, a mental obsession, like, it'll always convince us it'll be different this time, no matter what the consequence is. Um, you know, and once I start, I knew I couldn't stop. My body craved more and more and more and more. And that, like, spiritual malady I identified with, like, immediately, like I said, I think, you know, some people drink socially or have normal productive functional lives and then cross a line I think I was like born across that line you know just broken and looking for something to fill that and for a long time the drugs and the alcohol did until they didn't anymore um you know and I had that light bulb moment of like 
smash the idea that like I could stop if I want to I just don't want to like that wasn't real anymore like here I was wanting to be sober in the fifth rehab a fucking year later wasting time in and out of treatment um one foot in the door of Alcoholics Anonymous one foot out the door and I couldn't stay sober um and that's when things like really 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 started to change for me I uh became willing um I know it sounds like really uh, simple or like kind of lame. I wish there was like some cooler way to tell it. But it was as simple as like I had tried to manipulate and like connive every possible like scheme that I could to still get high and not have consequences or not get high but not fully do a 12-step program or whatever it was in between. Um, And none of those things worked for me. So I got to a point where I was broken enough that I was just like, okay, I'll do whatever. Um, And what that looked like in the beginning especially was going to meetings like five to seven times a week. um, Getting a sponsor and telling them everything. Not just like, hi, can I come with you to a meeting? Uh, Or only like if I feel like using or not. Like telling them another human being everything. Um, That's when sponsorship really changed for me. And um, getting a home group, um, I still was, like, shy. In the first home group that I got in Buffalo, I, like, thought I was a home group member for probably six months before I ever was, like, oh, yeah, can I, like, sign the book? Like, um, I want to, like, actually be a home group member here and get to know people and do service and help out. Um, But that really helped me a lot, you know. And um, the first... Uh, I had like a rocky start with like finding a sponsor and I think that like solid sponsorship is super, super, super important. Um, uh, But finally I found a sponsor. I would take the bus to her house once a week and we went through um, the big book line by line and I took all the steps in there. Um, And then fast forward a little bit, like I, I know some people are like, all fellowship or all recovery or, you know, in the book. And I think that both are super, super important because I got to a place where the obsession was removed. I was pretty happy. I had started going to college. Life was pretty good. Um, I was, like I said, going to five to seven meetings a week um, and had that sponsor and went through the steps, but a lot of things were missing in my sobriety, a relationship with God was missing. I totally just like ducked and dived the second and third step. Again, didn't have solid sponsorship, was just doing the best I could with what I had. And AA itself was like my higher power, but I outgrew that when I was like two years sober and didn't really have a higher power going on. Um, And I really was missing um, a fellowship. I failed to like make friends in when I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous because there wasn't HA yet but I failed to make friends in Alcoholics Anonymous and like really fall in love with the home group and fellowship with people I remember getting to a point where I was two years sober like what's the fucking point if I feel this way um you know sober and still feel like sad and empty and like something's missing um I'm talking a long time sorry um, fast forward a little bit, I, things really, really changed for me around two or three years sober. I got an amazing sponsor who I let get to know me inside and out. And she shared, you know, who and what she was inside and out. And we went like super deeply, thoroughly back through the steps. Um, and she taught me about the traditions and the concepts and inner group and area and all this shit that I had never heard about. Um, and like blew the door open for me on service and I also got a a home group at that time that I fell in love with it wasn't a YPA meeting but it was a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who were super friendly and in love with you know recovery and uh, and that really changed things for me Um, and just my experience like I said I was super agnostic and that was just fine Uh, it talks about in our book like If you're willing to believe that just maybe there's something, good enough. Like, you can make a beginning. And that was all as far as I had gotten, you know, two years in. uh, I wasn't praying uh, other than, like, the prayer at the beginning or the end of the meeting. Um, And just the group and the steps were, like, my higher power. And then I got to a place where, like, 
that just needed to change, you know, and the, the, the more spiritual journey this has become the last six years of my sobriety has been, um, I just call it God. I don't know what God is. Uh, I can't define it. I don't know if it's like, you know, male, female, whatever, don't care. Um, it's just like a friend that I pray and talk to. And I've read all different kinds of spiritual literature. I've checked out probably 20 different kinds of churches, um, gone to like spiritual talks and, and I think that's like the point of the 11th step is like just to seek, you know, continue to seek. And that's what, um, sobriety has done for me was like introduce me to spirituality and higher power. Um, and another huge thing for me has been sponsorship, being able to carry the message to those who still suffer, you know, in, uh, Eight years of sobriety, I have tried to sponsor a lot, a lot, a lot of women. And some have stayed sober. Um, some have stayed sober and just moved or gotten different sponsors or gotten different sponsor when I moved out here. Um, and a lot of them have, like, not stayed sober, you know. And it talks about in our book that, like, us trying to carry the message to somebody else, like, keeps us sober, you know, whether they stay sober or not. And a lot of times I see people who come back later, you know, um, after the seed has been planted, but that's like key for me, you know, today, uh, things look a little bit different. So in sobriety, I went from this like 19 year old junkie, alcoholic, uh, thief, homeless, uh, not in school, not working, heroin addict to like where my life is today, which is pretty amazing. I started in early sobriety, just taking like bullshit classes at Buff State um, fast forward five and a half years, like I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in biology. I work in a lab. Um, I still feel like an imposter. Like I'll hear people sometimes talk about, uh, there's an old lady who works there and she's like, I went to the park the other day and I think people were doing weed. And I think like, I think like if anybody who knew, you know, of where I like came from and that I work here today, like, I don't know if they'd let me have a freaking badge to the building. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I went from sick relationship to sick relationship to sick relationship. And I learned in uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, like how to have healthy relationships with other human beings. And today I have like a healthy marriage with uh, some of you know, John, who's 10 years sober in this program as well. Um, we just had a baby, which is so crazy to me. Like I couldn't even take care of myself and like shower and brush my teeth regularly and eat a meal. And today I like take care of a baby. Um, you know, and we have a house and we have pets that we like remember to feed and, <laughs> um, in that peace of mind, you know, I don't, I have a lot of anxiety. I'm a pretty anxious person, and I don't always, you know, feel 100%. Um, circumstances happen. John has some health stuff, which sucks. We lost his mom last year to really bad cancer, which was hard. Like, life isn't always easy, but, like, the peace of mind that I have today most days, I don't wake up feeling like somebody's throwing a cinder block at my chest, and I just come to realizing what a piece of shit I am and wanting to die. Like, I don't wake up that way. You know, I might wake up and say, like, oh, it's Monday. I don't want to go to work or whatever, you know, but I say a prayer and, like, can be grateful for my life today, you know. And like I said, things look a little bit different. I don't have time to go to seven meetings a week and sponsor ten people and do all the intergroup service I did for a long time, but, like, um, that's okay. Like, God meets us where we're at. You know, I still try to go to, like, three or four meetings a week. Uh, I sponsor a handful of people right now. Uh, we're doing a drop the rock study, which is cool. Um, you know, I have a home group in Alcoholics Anonymous. I used to have a home group in Heroin Anonymous. I just, uh, like I said, uh, didn't have as much time for it anymore, but I want to go to more HA meetings. I'm so grateful that this is the two year anniversary of this meeting. You know, I remember this meeting, like paving the way. Uh, and then the problem solve group started with like eight of us in my living room talking about, you know, all the people dying and like, how can we start a meeting? And like less than two years later, like there is a freaking inner group in an area and a meeting schedule and like meetings every single day of the week and 40 people here on a Monday night to like be sober and uh, hear the message. And uh, that almost makes me like want to cry. But um, 
I'm just really grateful to be here. I'm really grateful to be sober and alive, and I'm grateful that all of you are here um, to listen to me. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you.